What's well, motivation in it? They just need the money. Because they're spending money right and left already. Majestic is your name. We're glad to have you here this morning. Let's all stand as we begin our time of worship this morning. So glad to have everybody back in the house tonight and this morning. Oh Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name and all the Welcome you to First Baptist Church. It's been uh, nice, I guess, for some of us to be able to, uh, to be virtual for almost a month, but it is sure nice to be back together. And uh, our hope is that we won't have to go virtual again. Um, I think that uh, a lot of you have uh, decided to get the vaccine, and we've seen numbers continue to fall, which is great. Uh, we want to continue to pray for those that are hospitalized. I know that there are families that are struggling with the loss of loved ones. But uh, we're excited about all that 2021 is going to bring to us, ministry opportunities. And one of the ones that uh, began really in December uh, was the food distribution. And so uh, that food distribution continues this Thursday from 2 to 4.30. Uh, we've partnered with Second Harvest. We've been approved uh, through them, and they'll be visiting here uh, to kind of look at everything to, to see what we do and how we're doing it. But it looks like that will become, at least in the beginning, a monthly endeavor. And we hope that we'll expand that uh, in the future to be more often than that. But uh, this Thursday, Second Harvest Food Distribution here at First Baptist Church, 2 to 4.30. Um, we would love to have you uh, to come and be a part of that. It's a great way to do ministry. And we know that when we're active doing the things that God has designed for us to do, uh, we receive blessing. Uh, and I would say to you that the blessing, as much as the food that we distribute and that blesses people, that the ability to serve is, is a blessing uh, in itself. And so we encourage you to come. Uh, again, if you want to look at the bulletin, you'll see, show up at 1 p.m. Uh, for that. We're also, uh, this afternoon at 5 o'clock, there is Experiencing God. 
uh, kind of a, a, a last, uh, I think this is the last meeting of it, if I'm not mistaken. So I encourage you to come to that at 5. And then at 6 o'clock, we're back on regular schedule. So we'll have evening worship tonight uh, as well. Wednesday evening, activities full, just like what we had um, before, uh, before Christmas. Um, and we go back to the schedule that we've had since June 7th. Uh, when we made our return. And so we're looking forward to time uh, this, uh, this year in which we can get back to a full, fully back to the things that we enjoyed. Um, and that's just, it's just a matter of time. Uh, but I think that the light is at the end of the tunnel. Things look good. Uh, you look good. Some of you have looked better. Uh, and I know you'd say, well, Todd, you've looked better too. You need to get the haircut. Well, uh, that might happen in 2021 as well. Uh, but we are delighted to have you here today. Um, and I just encourage you to plug in as much as possible. We've been idle way too long. Uh, and this is an opportunity. Uh, we won't have too many volunteers. Uh, if, you know, if we have too many volunteers, it doesn't take... I mean, we have, we've ordered all these orange cones to help with traffic. We'll just make you a cone uh, if we need to do that. But uh, we, we would love to have you to help serve in that capacity. One o'clock. On Thursday. As we begin worship today, let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for our time together today. We thank you for Jesus, and we thank you for the opportunity that we have just to come into this place, this space. Lord, uh, we pray that you continue to provide protection to us as your people, that you would be with our nation, be with our church, be with our community. Father, that Christ would be at the center of what we do. Be with those this week that have uh, pending surgeries, and we pray that you'd be present with them. And Father, that you would strip away their worry or any fear that they might be having. And Lord, we just entrust uh, these issues and everything else into your care. Father, be with us today as we worship. And Father, may we experience the amazing, transforming grace of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Again, we'd like to welcome you. Take a couple moments to uh, say a virtual hi to, to one another as we welcome each other to worship today. Let's all stand as we sing it. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in wails below, and all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory. the foe, white raiment shall be given, before the angels he shall know, his name confessed in heaven, then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the hosts of night, in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. You may be seated. You know, faith is the victory. As we begin our time this year of faith and beginning our basics, it goes back to faith. You know, faith stands for a couple of things, but one of them is forsaking all, I trust him. Whatever's going on in your life, whatever's going on in your world, we can forsake everything. Just forget it and trust God. Now, if you've never had that opportunity to trust God, faith also stands for something else. This is a gospel presentation that I learned a while back. And it deals with all five of your fingers, F-A-I-T-H. As we uh, go through that slide, you'll be able to follow along. F means forgiveness. You know, everyone has sinned and needs forgiveness. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it says in Romans 3.23. 
It's available. That forgiveness is available. It's available for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Sometimes we don't hear that anymore. John 3.16. We used to see baseball games and see John 3.16, and many of us could recite it. For God so loved the world that he gave. But the forgiveness is available, but it's not automatic. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, Matthew 7, 21. But it's also impossible. It's not that forgiveness is impossible, but it's impossible for us to enter heaven on our own. We rely on ourselves way too much. We rely on our own strengths way too much. We rely on our own actions and our own education to be able to be good. But it is by the grace of God, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, but it is the gift from God. Ephesians 2.8. And it's not by works so that no one can boast. I didn't make myself available. I didn't get myself in heaven. It's not of my works, Ephesians 2, 9. But we also have to turn. What does all this mean? We have to turn. We have to turn from our sin and ourself. It says, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That means we're all going to die. But we have eternal life should we turn. And that is to turn to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. And if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised, you from, raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Sometimes we just need to hear these scriptures over and remind ourselves for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And when we turn, we have heaven here and the hereafter. Here, it says the thief comes at night to steal and kill and destroy. We've seen the thief come this year to steal our hopes, to steal our faith, to steal our lives. But God has come, Jesus has come, that they may have life and have it to the full. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. I will take you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Faith, forgiveness, it's available. It's impossible for us to go to heaven with sin that we have to turn to God. And when we turn to God, he gives us heaven. We can praise him for all that he's done. Sometimes we just need to hear those scriptures and get down to the basics of who we are. Let's all stand. Doxology.
Today we're going to be in Jeremiah, Jeremiah the 33rd chapter, beginning in verse 1 and going through verse 3, Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 1 through 3. And as you're turning there, I kind of want to give uh, history a little bit, kind of to, to expound upon what's happening in the story. So uh, this is some 300 years after the reign of King Solomon, uh, where Jeremiah is on the scene, okay? And so we remember David, he killed Goliath. We have King Saul who's in power. King Saul dies, David becomes king. David has his indiscretion. He has his kingdom. He reigns for a number of years. And then Solomon becomes king. And Solomon leads. And Solomon is known as one of the wisest kings uh, that ever, ever lived. Solomon is also in charge of building the temple. Uh, but Solomon wasn't good necessarily at preparing for what the future would hold. And so after Solomon, the kingdom is divided in two, okay? You have the northern kingdom of Israel, which would be Samaria, and the southern kingdom of Judah. The southern kingdom would also include the city of Jerusalem, okay? And so after that, it's just a whole string of kings, okay? And then finally, there's a boy king that comes to reign, King Josiah. And it's during King Josiah's reign that Jeremiah is on the scene. Now, what do we know about King Josiah? King Josiah uh, Israel had reached a point, or the people of God had reached a point where they had forsaken God. They'd forgotten about what all he had done for them. Um, and we know this because when King Josiah does some repairs to the temple, he finds an old copy of the book of Deuteronomy, which has all the law. And so he begins to introduce some Deuteronomy reform, okay, to take the book of Deuteronomy and begins putting into place the things of old. Now, what's amazing about that is it's the things of old. In other words, God's word was a forgotten reality at the time that Josiah finds it. And so when Josiah finds it, it's like nostalgic. Oh, this sounds good. This can implement reform. This might help our nation. And so King Josiah begins implementing those reforms. And Jeremiah becomes a prophet of God. He's a, he's a prophet of God. And what does that mean? It means that he is telling the truth. He is giving um, words from the Lord. And he's speaking to the people about the things that they need to do. Now, what I would tell you is there's a lot of similarities between this time period that Jeremiah is speaking and the modern era. And I think one of the reasons is, is because whereas uh, we normally have been accustomed to having God's Word as a prominent display in homes and in places, it doesn't, we don't have to go very far today to find people that do not understand God's Word or do not follow God's Word or do not heed God's Word. Uh, we don't have to go very far at all. And yet the truth of God is still being told, it's still being delivered, it's still being preached through a variety of mediums, through a variety of ways and circumstances. And we don't just have one Jeremiah today, we have multiple Jeremiahs, if you will, trying to cause and trying to institute reforms in which God's people or people in our community or people in our world can return to God and continue to pursue the truth that's been laid out from the very beginning. In Jeremiah chapter 33, it's reached a very pivotal point. Now this is after King Josiah. King Josiah reigns for some 30 years, I believe I should say, somewhere between 20 and 30 years. Josiah is now dead. Okay, there's a whole string of kings that come on the scene. None of them are very great at all. And so what, what has happened when we get to Jeremiah chapter 33, the Babylonians have arrived. The pagans have arrived. And there is fear in the city of Jerusalem. There is fear in Judah. And so basically Jeremiah is under house arrest. The city of Jerusalem has not fallen yet. It will come a little later in 586 and 587. That's somewhere in that period is where the city of Jerusalem falls. But Jeremiah is being confined basically to a chamber. Okay, They want to keep tabs on him to make sure he's not a spy. Uh, he's a prophet. 
He's not a spy. It's interesting how truth tellers often get caught up in the drama of the day. But Jeremiah is confined. And this is what we find in Jeremiah chapter 33 verses 1 through 3. It says, while Jeremiah was still confined in the courtyard of the guard, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. Verse 2. This is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Fathers, we come to you today and as we look into your word, I pray that we would do exactly what Jeremiah records here in this passage. That we would come to you That we would listen for your voice. And that we would heed your call. We would follow your guidance. Listening to your warning. Our situation is dire. Our help comes from the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. May his will be ours. And may our will be his. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. One of the first things I want you to think about when you look at this passage, and it's so hard to bring you back. I, you know, I, I wish that we could, we could go and we could venture into the unfolding drama of what's happening here in Jeremiah. That we could take a tour uh, kind of as an objective or kind of like a fly on the wall to see all that's going on in the city of Jerusalem and see all that's going on in the kingdom. You see, because the, the richest history of the kingdom had already been... They had had the grandeur of the temple being built. They had had the grandeur of King David and King Solomon. But they had forgotten at some point who it was that made all that possible. You see, when God speaks, we will know it. And that's one of the things I want you to understand. When God speaks, you're going to know it. I've had several people over the last 20 years, and no, this did not happen this week. I've had several people over the last 20 years come into my office, uh, or in the office where I was, and to say, God wanted me to tell you this. And usually whatever it is that God wants to tell me is some kind of issue that they want me to pursue, okay? Um, and, you know, I, and this doesn't just happen to me. It happens to, gosh, everybody. I, I don't know of a pastor that's not happened to uh, as we share war stories is what I like to call them. Uh, but if God wants to say something, he's going to tell you. He doesn't necessarily need. And you say, well, why in the world would we pay attention to Jeremiah? Because you and I need to understand that times were different. And the way that God's people related to God were different in this time period. It's so easy for us to go back and try to impose our experience and our view and our relationship with God. And the way God relates to us onto the story and onto this snippet of history. You need to understand the Holy Spirit was not indwelling in people in this time period. Prophets had come on the scene to be the voice of truth and the voice of hope for God's people. God's people relied on those prophets to help guide them in some unthinkable and completely chaotic moments. Today, when God speaks, we will know it. Jeremiah, it says, is recorded here, heard from God a second time. And I want to say this to us too. Be wary of individuals who always have a word from God for you. I'm reminded of of a pastor, and um, this pastor... When he spoke or when he preached every Sunday, he would say, God told me this week X and I'm to tell you this. Now, I'm not saying I've never said that, but I'm going to tell you, you can probably count on one hand the number of times that I've uttered the words, God told me to tell you. Because uh, there have been moments in ministry where God has revealed himself in overwhelming ways 
through storms that we face or through experiences that communities have faced. And we say, you know, God has said to me or God communicated to me. And I want you to know, I try to communicate with God on an everyday basis. I, I want to consistently hear from Him. But it's very rare that God says, Todd, you will say this to the people specifically. It's happened, but it's not an everyday event. But yet there are some people out there who always have a word from the Lord. You kind of get the impression that God is in their closet. God is in their domain. God is in their house. And they're constantly surrounded by Him all the time. And while that may be true in the spirit of things, we need to be careful of being God's spokesperson. And if you choose to be God's spokesperson, you better make sure that what you share is the very words of God. How do we know that? Well, we know that because that's what God's Word teaches. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, 7 through 11, the Bible tells us the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear minded and self controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love one another deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If you serve, serve with the strength that God provides. If you speak, speak as if you're speaking the very words of God. So that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ our Lord. We need to be careful what we say. We need to be careful what we speak. And it becomes even more vitally important when we're in a position to speak God's truth. We better make sure if we're going to be God's mouthpiece that what we speak is coming from the one who's given his life for us. Be careful. When God speaks, we will know it. And I want you to notice who it is that is speaking and calling and giving counsel to Jeremiah. Jeremiah. It's the Lord. Now, when we say the Lord, you know, we, we say the Lord, but when you look in the original language here, it's the intimate word for God, Yahweh. They would rarely, they rarely ever uttered that word. In fact, if you go into a Jewish synagogue today and they're doing this passage, they will actually skip over the word the Lord. They won't call it out of reverence, out of respect for the Almighty. The significance of who is doing the action here of Yahweh is absolutely essential to us. Because what do we know Yahweh means? Well, we know that Yahweh means I am that I am. Or he is the great I am. And this is what I want you to understand today. No matter what was facing Jeremiah. No matter what political problems were facing Jeremiah and the nation of Israel. No matter how much there was pillage and murder and distress. Even when he was confined it did not matter. The God who called him, the God who had spoken one time before, the God who is speaking the second time is the God who is. God is always present. God is never past. God is never future. He is. And wherever we are, that's where he is. We need to understand that God is always a present reality for everything that we're facing each and every day. He's not behind us. He's not ahead of us. He is with us. This Lord that is speaking is the great I am. And what I think is interesting too about the opening verse is the Bible tells us and goes at great length to tell us that Jeremiah is confined. Jeremiah is cut off from the world. Jeremiah can't do as he pleases. He doesn't have the freedom. He is shut out of everyone and everything that would mean, that would, that would mean he would have freedom and vitality. And what I want you to know is this, that even though... Jeremiah is confined. Even though the Babylonians have him basically in shackles or in prison, imprisonment in this moment, it does not prevent the word of God from coming to him. We can be shut out. We can be shut down. We can be confined. We can experience every travesty under the sun. And it will not prevent the great I am from speaking. And it will not prevent the great I am from working and acting in the midst of our story. What is 
God's word revealed to Jeremiah. He says in verse 3, Call to me, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Prayer is the means through which God speaks. God says to Jeremiah, call to me. In other words, pray to me. Seek me. And I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things. One of the problems that we have in this life is we don't like change. We don't. There are very few people in this world that like change. Uh, and, and I was thinking, what changes do I like? Well, there's one change that I like. Okay, that just kind of popped in my head. I love in the fall where we fall back. Okay, the time changes and I get to gain an hour. Now, why do I like that change? Because it benefits me. We like changes that benefit us. We don't like to be inconvenienced. That is true of all of us. Nearly all of us. The only change that we like are the changes that are going to make us happier. But not everything that God does, not all the changes that we have to embrace are changes that advance what we want. They're not often changes that will always make us happy. Jeremiah is called and instructed to call to God. Call to me. And I'll answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things. Now, that means that our relationship with God, we have to be willing to hear what he's saying. Ladies and gentlemen, oftentimes we don't want to hear what God is saying. We want to, what I call, strip mine the Bible and strip mine the gospel. What do I mean by that? It means we want to take the nuggets away or we want to take the things from Scripture away that make us feel good and we want to toss the other away we don't we don't you know we want the blessings of God without the responsibility of following God we want salvation we don't want discipleship we want freedom we don't want obedience in order to have the freedom of Christ we have to be obedient to Christ the way that we seek God is through the means or the medium of prayer we need to call out to him if we're desiring to know what is in store for us. And one of the things that you know, I've, I've tried to focus on more and more in the last seven years is the big picture. I don't like to be caught up in the minute details of day-to-day -day interaction. I want the, what's the big picture? Um, and I think that in a, this time that we have been uh, so shut down and shut in and you know, you know I, I, mem I remember I said uh, during the holidays, you know, spend time with your family. And someone said, I've spent time with my family. I'm, I'm over that. <laughs> I'm over that. Um, and I was like, you know what? That's, that's true. <laughs> I have spent time with my family. Uh, yeah, and I, I can understand that. I'm kind of over that. Um, but, you know, it's so hard to be able to see clearly because it just seems dismal, 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 day in and day out. When you turn on the news, it's just negative and 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 negative. And this person's sick and this person's dying. And it's just, it's never ending. Here's the big picture. God has not forgotten. God is fully aware. And there are better days ahead. Don't. Give up. So many people in this race give up at this point. They just throw in the towel. I'm just done. And they're like three, four, we're three fourths through this. Don't give up. Don't allow the circumstances of your world to completely obliterate what God wants to do in your story and what He wants to do in the life of the church. Now, this is what I believe. I believe. That this pandemic has forced us to look inside. And I'm going to tell you that after months and months of talking with people and meeting on Zooms on Monday nights and Wednesday nights and Friday nights. A lot of people have said this in so many ways. 
Todd, I've spent some time looking inside, and I don't like what I see. If that's true, if there's things inside here that you don't like what you see, change them. Change them. A fresh word from God, this great I am moving in your story and moving in your life. And what he's doing is preparing us for a time and a day of greatness. I believe that what we do in ministry, as whether it's working with this, uh, the person that we've been working with, with the trailer, or whether it's going overseas or whether it's serving at Raw Mountain, or whether it's becoming kind of a hub for Second Harvest Food Bank as we give out food. All of these initiatives are things that God wants to expound upon. Because the needs are great. And what we have when we intertwine with all of these individuals is we are able to meet the need that they present. But I want you to understand that just as Jeremiah was faced with a people that had needs that were being presented, there are needs that are not being presented. There are greater needs that are dormant. There are greater needs that lie under the surface. And our role and our goal spiritually is, yes, to meet the presenting concerns, but it is to address the concerns within. Because the concerns within have a much greater we will have a much greater ability to speak to the needs of Christ in the midst of who we are serving if we are not overwhelmed by the circumstances that we witness day in and day out. Prayer is the means through which God speaks. And when he's speaking, we need to make sure that we are listening and desiring to know what he has in store for us. And I would say to you this, Every time I've sought the big picture and tried to align my life and ministry to the big picture, what I will tell you is when the big picture becomes a reality, the big picture was much bigger than what I envisioned. So if you're thinking big, God's plan is going to be bigger. If you're thinking small, you're going to be overwhelmed. It's going to be too much for you to handle. God wants to move. In people's stories. There are churches in our area and in our communities that have shut their doors for all of 2021. There's a great need spiritually for people to connect to the body of Christ. And I want you to know what I think about that. I don't want fluff. I don't want people packing a pew that are nominally committed been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, have several of them. But what I want is to God to raise up, our God, this great I am, to raise up within us and within our community people who are absolutely solely committed to Jesus. And going to do everything in their power, everything in their strength to empty themselves of what they want and to pursue greater things. Jeremiah was able to maintain his composure, though the world around him was falling apart. What is it that God wants to accomplish when he answers us as we seek him in prayer? God wishes to tell us great and unsearchable things that we do not know. God is not a God of secrets. We've got to be ready to receive the word from God, from the Lord and I want you to understand, where were the people of Judah? The people of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, where Jerusalem was also, the city of Jerusalem was also a part of that, the southern kingdom. They were fickle. They had forgotten what it meant to be committed to the great I Am. And now encroaching on their properties, encroaching on the horizon of their lives, was the great kingdom of Babylon. And they were fearful as the Babylonian pandemic approached their lives. They lived in fear. They did not respond in faith. They continued to live life the way they wanted to live it. 
with little regard for what God wanted and for his purposes to be done. Even the leaders of the day had forsaken God. The kings were corrupt. The leaders were corrupt. There were people hurt in the cities. There were people hurt in the streets. There were people hurt in the rural areas of the kingdom. There were people hurt in the metropolitan areas. There was oppression all around. How do I know that? Because Jeremiah himself was confined. Take a good look at our world today. Just take a good look. I think one of the most dawning realities that I've had occurred about three weeks ago when I asked this question to people on Zoom, about 20 to 25 people. I said, name for me a role model in leadership today and there was a long long pause it took a long time for somebody to come up with an answer and the person that came up with the answer came up with a person that was a good answer the problem is that the person's dead our role model is the man who went to the cross for us. Our role model is the great I am who speaks to the desert of our lives and the spiritual depravity of our lives and the circumstances of our lives. Our world can be falling apart. And when I look out about the last several weeks and I see all of the ridiculous bloodshed and chaos and confusion and assault on liberty when I look at a capital that here's ladies and gentlemen it's a great building I just want you to know it's not the source of my strength okay it's a building it will fall and it will turn to rubble one day why is it that we put so much faith in the temple it was even said, this is the temple of the United States. Be careful. When you put your faith in a temple, you will be disillusioned with your God when the temple falls. My God's not contained in a temple in Washington. My livelihood is not determined by an elected official that is as corrupt as the day is long. It's just not. My livelihood comes from the great I am who speaks, who's calling. And the question is, will we heed his words? The assault on Washington. And though this week I watched the inauguration, I was supposed to be there. That's like my bucket list, to go to every inauguration. Be careful what you say. I said, I'll never miss another one. <laughs> well, I did. And on TV, it looked like freedom reigned. All the president and his entourage safely were able to do everything they needed to do on that day, on Wednesday. But the backdrop of it is, you had nearly 30,000 troops Guaranteeing that freedom. So while they had freedom, greater Washington did not. Does our freedom come from government? Does our freedom come from our military? No. Freedom comes from Christ. And until you and I submit to him... We will be tied up and confined, even though we may live and roam as freely as we want. Freedom comes from Jesus. And I'll even go a step further. People will be politicizing this until Jesus comes back. I'm going to tell you this. Chaos and mayhem 
and confusion are the mainstay. It makes no difference to me whether there's insurrectionists in Washington or insurrection on the street of Portland and Seattle and every street and city across this world. There's no difference. And to try to draw a difference between those two is to miss the point that we as a nation are in trouble. And our response doesn't need to be, well, I you know, split hairs. Don't split hairs. <laughs> our response needs to be, let's seek God. The problem in this nation is not racial. Hate to disillusion you. It's not. We don't have a problem with racism in this country. We don't have a problem with economics in this country. We don't have a problem with poverty in this country. We don't have a problem with the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. What we have is a spiritual problem and our problem is we don't know Jesus. That's our problem. You may say, well, that sounds good, but Who's going to carry that message to the world? We are. We are God's spokespersons for this time and this era. And if you have become accustomed to praying for someone else, that God will raise somebody else up to do what God has ultimately called each of us to do, shame on you. We cannot sit idle anymore. The people of Judah did not heed the words from the Lord. And they were swept away. They were swept away with riots and pillage. And the fear that the Babylonians had brought to their kingdom. And they lived in that fear and exile for a number of years. And this is what I want to close with today. And this is my concern, not fear, but this is my concern for spiritual leadership in this time. There's a problem when the situations and the chaos and the noise that lies around us drowns out the still small voice of God who is supposed to be living in us. He's speaking with so much clarity. And what he's saying over and over and over and over again is, I love you. That's what he's saying. I love you. And what does he mean by that? He means by that that if you want to overcome evil, you overcome it with good. If you want to change people's hearts, it's not going to be by rising against them politically or putting out your statement or your thought on social media. It's about making sure that your heart is aligned to that which is God honoring, that which is centered in His will. Jeremiah found himself in some daunting circumstances he was probably present when the eyes of the king were gouged out and his children were executed before the king he witnessed the horrible barbaric nature of Babylonian of the Babylonian empire of the Babylonian leadership and when everybody else's faith was gone when the people of Israel and the people of Judah, when their faith was gone, there were a few, a remnant, a prophet of old, but a prophet of truth, who did not allow all the noise of that chaos to dull his ability to hear from God. God is speaking. And if you're here today and you say, I've not heard him in a long time. That's not a problem with God. That's a problem in what we're choosing to pay attention to more than him. Is all going to be well? It absolutely will. Are we going to face more trials and problems and situations? We absolutely will. But you know what? 
as the noise and clamor get louder and louder and louder and louder and louder and as the world gets more and more chaotic we just need to listen for his still small voice heed what he's saying do what he says because he is speaking and when he speaks we will know it we need to spend time in prayer Seeking his face, calling to him. And he unfolds the big picture and amazes us with the things that we didn't know, the unsearchable things that we didn't know. Do not be overwhelmed by the circumstances and the chaos. Be absolutely centered in the person that he's called you to be, and me to be, and us to be. There is no time like the now to trust in Him and have faith in Him. And as Carrie said earlier, demonstrate your faith in simple obedience, forsaking all I trust Him. And then you know what? It doesn't matter what's going on around us because the God in us will deliver us and see us to our completion. Father, we thank you for our time together today as we look in the words of the prophet of Jeremiah, how your truth speaks volumes, how we need to be encouraged, and how we are encouraged through how you've worked. Lord, I pray that you would be with this nation, be with our leaders. Father, may we understand that you are in full control. Even when people do not acknowledge you, you're in control. And the problems that we face is a problem that we don't know Jesus. Our nation is not centered in Christ. That is where our problems stem from. Everything else is symptomatic of that greater reality. Help us in this invitation to know that if we will simply respond in faith, trusting in Christ, that our lives can be re redirected. We can experience the peace that passes all understanding and the hope beyond hopes that we speak of and that we talk about and that we reminisce about it can be a reality today this is the invitation God as you invite us to forsake everything to follow you may we be faithful and obedient it's in Christ's name we pray amen this is a hymn of invitation if you're here this morning if you want to come to the altar to pray, you're welcome to do that. If you need to forsake everything and trust Him, if you need to let go of some things that have come on your horizon, that have absolutely daunted you, daunted your sensibilities, have overwhelmed you and overwhelmed your circumstances, God brings clarity. God brings hope. Why? Because He is the great I Am. He is always present even in this moment. This is the invitation. As we stand, as we sing, won't you come, won't you respond, forsaking everything, won't you trust Him? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit pray for this week that you're going to give us and Father we look forward to all the opportunities that are on the horizon we pray Lord as we tangibly meet people's needs that you would help us to have your eyes to see what lies beneath Father we pray that you continue to expand our ministries, expand our minds and expand our vision for what you are doing and Father I pray that we would hear your still small voice, that we would not be overwhelmed by all that we witness but Father the Spirit of God 
your spirit that's reigning in us as we've accepted Lord, the Lord Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, would guide and direct our lives, that we would be overshadowed by your will and your will alone. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming.